Hey everybody, Brandon here. Welcome to the channel and thanks for tuning in. Well, the time has finally come. I'm putting out my top 10 running back show. This is a pre-draft edition. I'll be sure to be uh, probably doing another show similar to this after we get two very important pieces uh, in our analysis and that is draft capital and landing spots. I'm one who has always said landing spots matter, but you know, I'm a Debbie guy. I've been watching these players for three years and it's about three weeks before the draft. So it's time to get out my top 10 here on my YouTube channel. I've been watching these guys for three years um, since they were freshmen. Um, I'm a film guy primarily, so I um, had a lot of fun uh, you know, scouting these players. So um, hit that subscribe button, man. You play Dynasty, you play Fantasy. Um, not only are you going to get shows like this for this year's class, but shortly after the draft, we are going to be doing the 2025 uh, draft class, uh, you know, um, you know, digging into that class to help you get an early look at even next year. All right. So I already did a QB show that I put out about a month ago. So go check that out. Um, on the channel here, and then very shortly, I'm going to be doing a wide receiver show and tight end show. I'll be getting them done before the draft, and like I said, I'll be doing uh, probably a post-draft show right after the draft as well. So, um, got a lot of running backs in this class. We got, you know, we got some bigger guys, we got some smaller guys, and some guys in between, right? So there is a lot of running backs here that and they all win in many different ways. A lot of projection in this class, right? The talk of the town has certainly been that there's no top tier guys that are clear wide, re you know, running back ones. Um, not like last year where it was pretty much Bajan and, uh, and Gibbs. And then you could, you know, certainly make a case for who would be RB three in last year's class, but here right off the top, man, it is a, um, it's like the wild, wild west out there. There's a lot of different RB ones out there, uh, but that's what we got to do, right? We're going to have to pick and, and see who we like in this class. And I think draft capital landing spots will help us make those decisions as we head into our rookie drafts after the draft. But um, got a lot of backs in here. I mean, yeah, it's a down class, but I'm not thinking that there isn't going to be a useful dynasty player here, at least for a couple years. And one or two of these backs may find themselves in a great opportunity, like going to the Cowboys, right? Who really don't have a running back on their roster right now um, that will, you know, inflate their value after the draft, right? So it's good to kind of take a look at their film, take a look at their metrics, whatever you do to scout these running backs. But I'm going to give you my top 10. And then at the end of the show, I'm going to uh, kind of give you, you know, my tier four players too, that are most likely going to be late round three guys, undrafted free agents. Um, but, you know, before I get started, man, I just wanted to plug a, 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 um, a subscription service that I have called the Debbie to Dynasty Dashboard. Um, it's a, a big database of uh, classes and, and scouting reports, all 22 films I break down for my subscribers. But, you know, if, you're, if you play Dynasty and you're looking for the 2025 draft class, I already have that class ranked all by position, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. Same thing for 2026 and 2027. It's a great resource. It's very unique. Not many things out there like it. You know, hit me up on the email that you see at the bottom of the screen, all right? It's a pretty cool prospect, uh, a prospect list, over 500 future, hopefully, dynasty assets, all right? So uh, I like to do rankings based on, you know, 1 through 10, 1 through 15, 20, whatever, but I also kind of group them in tiers as well. And there really isn't any tier one running back I see in this class. And a tier one running back for me is an immediate full-time starter and a primary lead back. Now, some of the players we're going to talk about today, they may find themselves in a lead role role um, simply because there's an opportunity there. But as we've seen in the running backs um, with the NFL, they're very disposable. They're very, I mean, thing values change quickly. Teams are easily moved off an immediate starter and will, you know, draft. And I think year after year, what we're going to find is if they're like the running back class for 2025 is pretty deep. It's probably a really good class. So a lot of the players we're going to talk about today may start for 2024 season, but they may get replaced next year with a better talent. There's probably maybe two or three, four even tier one running backs in the 2025 class. And again, if you subscribe to my dashboard service, you know, I have them all ranked with scouting reports and film links and all sorts of stuff too. So yeah, we get to kind of get deep on this YouTube channel. So tier one, there's not many tier one running backs, I think in this class where they're going to get an immediate, um, you know, starting position, you know, unless it just the opportunity is there, like I said, for the Cowboys, maybe one or two other teams like the Giants and I think Vikings, you know, with Aaron Jones there, they might also get a, um, you know, a future running back in this class, but we'll have to see. So let's get right to it, man. All right, we're going to start off with my tier two running backs. All right. And I have Blake Quorum as my RB one of the class. All right. 
Um, I'm really big when I watch film. I am into footwork, right? And I just think that he's got the best feet in the class. I think he's got really good vision. And vision and feet and the ability to create space is, I think, three hallmarks of a running back success in the NFL. And, of course, play strength and functional play strength as well. And I think Blake Corn, for his size at 5'8", 2'10", has got that ability um, I think he's a little heavier than 210, actually. But, um, you know, he's got the overall skill set in this, what we call a down class. So I got Blake Corum. Yeah, there's going to be people that say he played for Michigan and they opened up wide holes, man. But if you really watch the All-22 film, and I've watched a lot of his games, um, you know, he's got the ability to redirect with his feet. And um, I think he's just a good pro. I think the, you know, intangibles are there. He's a gym rat. He's in great shape. Um, Harbaugh's been talking him up now that he's the coach of the Chargers. And then, listen, he might just end up on the on the Chargers, and I, I could certainly see that happen. Now, he's an underrated pass catcher as well. I should have mentioned right here getting started. You can see the player cards here that you see on the screen, guys. I mean, if you want in-depth you know, scouting reports on each of these players, these players, these top 10 players that I'm going to talk about, I have different shows on this YouTube channel where you can actually go and my podcast co-host Jason DiRienzo and I, we break down the scouting report and have in-depth discussions on exactly what we see. And of course, then on my dashboard, I've got film breakdowns on all these players as well. But I, I got Blake Corm as my number one. I know there's a lot of guys that fade Blake Corm. He's older and stuff. I don't think the NFL really cares anymore about the age of these running backs and wide receivers coming out, and even quarterbacks for that matter. They're looking for, you know, the first four-year contract that's cheap. These guys are most likely all going to be late day two, day three guys. You can see on the player card here for Quorum, that's where I have him kind of penciled in in the draft at the second and third round. So they're going to be cheap assets, right? And they're going to be all very replaceable. So that's what we have to be careful about drafting these running backs is like with next year's class, like I said, a lot of these guys could be just replaced immediately after year one, year two, because they're cheap assets and they can move off them pretty easy. But going back to my RB1, I have Blake Quorum. Um, I, I just think, you know, the coaching staff is going to love a guy like this. He's a pro. He's just a good, solid football player. He's got some good film out there. Um, so he is my RB1 of the class. I think he could be the first running back taken off the board, but we're not sure. All right. Coming in at number two, I got Trey Benson. All right. So the reason I got Trey Benson number two, he, he tested athletically great at the combine. But, you know, at six foot two sixteen, I mean, the guy has got the size. He's got some good feet as well. Good contact balance. We saw the burst at the combine. Um, he's got good ball security. Never puts the, the you know the um, the ball on the ground. Um, my big question is, can he can create on his own? I'm really big with running backs on how they create space. Right? We talk about creating space for wide receivers, but I think running backs as well. Um, you know, they need to create. All the great running backs that we have on our dynasty teams are guys that can create on their own when plays break down. That they can adjust and pivot, reaccelerate. And I think Trey Benson has that ability. He's got the home run speed to make some chunk yards after getting through the line of scrimmage. And in a down class, is he the perfect prospect? No, but given the other opportunities out there that we're going to talk about here as we go through this top 10 list, I feel safer with Trey Benson having three years of decent, solid production at Florida State. Um, you know, his film can be a little inconsistent. So I'm going to give you the pros and the cons of all of these players because each one of these running backs have traits that have concerns. That's why it's not like a great class, right? So we need to talk about that. Um, he's got inconsistent film for like every great play that you see on film. He's got two or three duds where he makes, you know, he's a little indecisive at the at the, at the line of scrimmage, and I like guys with good vision. So he's going to have to improve his decision-making process to hit those holes. But I'll tell you, when he does hit a gap, when he does run an out zone, outside zone scheme and finds a cutback lane, he can do some damage and make guys miss in the second level. I think he's got some ability to create space, make guys miss. He's got the, the thick frame that you need to withstand in the NFL. Even though the NFL is dabbling with these smaller you know, running backs. You know, we had Devon A. Chan last year. Everyone's excited about it, but we'll have to see in Miami if he can hold up you know, through the, through the contact and the vigors of an NFL season. He didn't last year. He got nicked up a little bit. So Trey Benson has that size. Um, he's got the ability. He's got some good footwork. The vision is, is hit or miss, but given the other options in this class, I feel comfortable taking Trey Benson here as my RB2 in the class. 
All right. Coming in at number three is Jonathan Brooks. All right. So Jonathan Brooks is RB1 for a lot of people. He's coming off an ACL injury, as we all know. Very disappointing. He had to wait his turn behind Bajan, had his wait his turn behind Roshan Johnson. So our sample size is very limited. We have one year of production. What we saw on film was nice. You can see on the scouting report here on the card, he's got really good feet. I like to say, do you got sweet feet or beat feet or somewhere in between? I think he's got the footwork to redirect. He's got good contact balance. He's got fresh legs, man. There's not a lot of wear and tear on Jonathan Brooks. Brooks, I think everyone's making the assumption in today's medical world that ACL injuries are not what they used to. Most people coming back from ACLs do not lose a step. Um, but I think he's got good patience. He's got you know functional play strength. Um, he also is a really good pass protector. And I think that's an underrated trait for a lot of running backs out there that is not discussed. And when you watch all 22 film, which we do all the time with my dashboard subscribers, you know, he had 51 reps here in pass protection. I got a note here. I got um, on a scouting report that I read somewhere and he didn't allow a single pressure or sack on the plays. So he's a good pass protector. And I think there's a lot of running backs that don't make it in the NFL. They may have the vision and the ability to, to, to you know, run the ball and get those chunk yards. But, man, they are a liability in the passing game. And I think Jonathan Brooks is a physical enough player where he's going to stand in there and give their quarterback a time to, you know, make a play if a play breaks down. So I think that, you know, like I said, is an underrated trait that a lot of people don't look at as part of, you know, a, a running back staying on the field. So, I mean, they're not going to keep you on the field if you are a liability in passing downs, right? Um, you're not going to jeopardize your franchise quarterback for a running back who doesn't give an effort and can't block a blitzing linebacker or at least chip an edge rusher or something. So he's targeted to be back in July and be available full at camp. Of course, he didn't participate in the combine or anything like that. So a little bit of a projection with Jonathan Brooks showed some flash, showed some ability to create and get chunk yards, had some really good pass plays too. He's got some good hands. Um, so you can see he had 26 receptions uh, throughout his career, but the majority of those came in his junior year. He is a true junior running back, so he, we only have three years um, of film on him, but really it's one year of consistent film where he was the primary ball carrier at Texas. All right. So my number four RB in the class is Jalen Wright. Now, I've liked Jalen Wright, 5'11", 210 pound, true junior as well. Now, if you go back and watch his film from Tennessee, you know, he is a, I consider when I look at, at Jalen Wright, the first thing that comes to me is he is a raw talent, all right? He's never been a bell cow at Tennessee. He's always shared uh, the backfield uh, with Jabari Small and a couple other backs as well. They had some incoming freshmen last year that they dabbled in, but the dude is a track and field athlete. Um, he has his athleticism is outstanding, and he really had one of the fastest 40 times, I believe, at the combine. And as we know, the NFL loves speed, man. So, you know, Jalen Wright, he, again, this is a true projection. You're, you know, the NFL drafts traits, and I think Jalen Wright has shown the ability to run with the football inside and outside versatility. I think he's got some really good contact balance. Excuse me. Um, on this channel, go back. I put a scouting report out on him kind of breaking down his film on this YouTube channel. Go check that out. But again, he's also a really good pass protector, really good pass protector. So I like that as well. Um, so let's talk about what are the, the biggest knock I hear on Jalen Wright, right? His lack of production only being because he's not been a bell cow. So, you know, if he didn't get a full carry workload at Tennessee, can we think that he can do that in the NFL level? And, and the answer is most likely probably not. But all the backs that we're really talking about, I think with the outside of maybe Quorum and Trey Benson, um, have the ability maybe to be primary ball carriers. Jalen Wright is not. I don't project him going to the NFL and getting the rock and being a full-time player. He is going to be a, you know, part of a committee um, and, and, and kind of that's where we are. So 81% of his runs, a note here came on my scouting report came against light boxes, right? So, you know, he didn't get the, you know, the eight man fronts and, and stuff like that. He, he had very light boxes in that wide open, you know, Tennessee offense. So, but nonetheless, man, he's got good contact balance. He can catch the ball out of the backfield, made some really nice receptions in 2024, 
Um, so or 2023 rather. So, you know, I can see where he is. And again, on the, on the, on the player card here, guys, there's a lot of details. I'm not really going to go spend a lot of time breaking down each one. Again, go back and watch my rookie report on him. If you want us and if you want an in-depth of each of these players. All right. So my last player in tier two, and I'm not sure I described what my tier two was, but my tier two players are day two picks round two and three round one, early round two rookie picks and could lead a committee contributing immediately. That's what these tier two uh, running backs are. And that's with Blake Corum, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, Jalen Wright. And then my last tier two running back is Marshawn Lloyd, five foot nine, 217 pounds. All right. So he led the draft class with 8.2 yards per touch in 23, one of the best in college football. Good athleticism. Love the way he tempos his runs. I think he's got a three down skill set. He's got a lot of tools in his toolbox. He's got the stop start ability at his senior bowl. He put on a show showing those sweet feet that we like the ability to redirect and run outside. So I think he's got some really quick feet. The big thing with Marshawn Lloyd is his inconsistent vision, um, missing cutback lanes. I think a lot of times he likes to look for the big play versus taking what's in front of him. Um, he needs to understand to, I think he works too much in structure following a play versus the ability to maybe, you know, go off script a little bit and adjust if following the play doesn't work out the way it's supposed to. Didn't see him really readjust and, and, and make some cutbacks and stuff that were visibly open watching his all 22 film. Um, really, this was one of my favorite players coming out of high school. He was a high recruit towards ACL early in his career. And then it took him two years to kind of, you know, at South Carolina to get back on track. But then he transfers to USC and has a really nice season. Um, pass pro, not so great. That's another little bit of a knock on him. So he's my RB5 in this class. I think he's got some ability. I think he's going to be a contributor to an offense, uh, a, a really good backup. But again, I don't see Marshawn Lloyd being a running back who is going to be given the keys to be a lead back in the committee. I think he's going to have to improve his vision a little bit. But nonetheless, I think the other traits that we talked about are, are, are really good. Um, and again, the NFL drafts traits. So if they see a player, I mean, each one of these running backs has a flaw somewhere in their game, right? There's, there, there's no Bajon Robinsons or, you know, Gibbs in this, in this class. So, you know, we're going to talk about the good and the bad, and that's what the NFL is going to be faced with. They're going to be taking these running backs, knowing that they're, they're all projections they are all works in progress. And all these guys can improve to some degree. And that's the job of the NFL franchises and coaching staffs is to draft these players, get them in their system and to coach them up to maybe become better players than what we're seeing in college football right now. All right, let's get to my tier three uh, ranks, basically. Uh, and these are round four and five NFL draft selections, uh, late round two, most likely round three dynasty rookie picks and part of a committee with the potential upside to be a solid backup. All right, so I'm going to start off with some size and physicality for my tiers, as much as the NFL for my tier three, but for, the, for as much as the NFL is looking for running backs that create space, these smaller guys, the the quicker, faster guys, I still think, you know, in the end, you still need a baseline physicality and play strength and desire and the ability to have, you know, have defenders bounce off you to be successful in the NFL. And the first guy I want to talk about, my RB6 of the class is Audric Estime from uh, True Junior out of Notre Dame, had a really good season. I mean, this guy is a powerful runner. Um, ran a 4.58 at his pro day after bombing uh, the combine 40. So who knows? It's probably more at 4.6. But you know, I'm not. I don't get hung up on 40 times for running backs. In fact, I don't get hung up on 40 times for wide receivers either. I think it's an overrated. You know, give me play, give me play speed over 40 time. A guy running in shorts who trains for the 40 every day for 30 days before going to the combine to get those. You know, I don't care if you're a four four guy or a four five one guy. I think we way overblow all these 40 time things. To me, what does you look like on the field? Do you have the short area quickness for running backs? For me, give me short area quickness and the ability to laterally move versus how fast can you run in a straight line? Because you need to to navigate lines of scrimmage. And I think Estime has the ability to, you know, I think he's got some versatility to his game and his feet to be able to make guys miss. Not a ton, um, but again, we're, we're RB6 at a tier three, A we're talking day three guys, right? And let's just talk about day three guys here for a minute as we enter our tier three of, of running backs here. 
Day three guys in running backs typically don't hit our dynasty rosters. Go back in history, look at the last five drafts, and you're going to see a lot of the guys we're excited about right now thinking that are going to hit our dynasty rosters really just don't. I don't mean to be the Debbie Downer here. I'm just talking reality. A lot of these players are going to be backups. They're going to find themselves in like uh, in situations that are drafted by teams. That's why draft capital and landing spots are going to matter so much because you could have a, a in Israel a Banaconda going to the Jets and his va- and his fantasy value as much as you thought he could you know be a great running back in the NFL. He's just buried behind Brees Hall. So a lot of these guys that we're going to talk about here are going to probably follow in his footsteps. But I'm going to go with estimate here is my RB six. Um, not the perfect prospect, but he's got the size. And if there's an NFL franchise out there that is looking for a running back who can be part, maybe they've got some smaller backs and they want someone who can really move the pile, be the physical um, you know, running team like the Titans might be a guy that Estime ends up landing on with Spears. They'd be a great one-two punch there. So I got Estime as my RB6. And again, go see his rookie report if you want an in-depth scouting report on these players, okay? A player I'm maybe higher on than most coming in in my RB7, a tier three prospect here, is Ray Davis, five foot eight, 220 pounds, older prospect. He's been all over the place, man. He played at Temple. He played at Vanderbilt. Now here he transfers to Kentucky and kicks ass and has a great season. And I like this guy. I'm not sure the NFL is going to care how old he is because they're going to draft Ray Davis on and on day three and say, okay, this kid can play. Um, I think he's got really good make guy miss attributes to his game. I think he's got really good vision. Love the way he navigates the line of scrimmage. He's a pass catcher. He's got contact balance. He's got yards after catch. He's not going to be the guy with the top end speed, and I don't care about that. I love how this guy, um, you know, navigates the line of scrimmage, and he will work for tough yards. He could be a true workhorse, like plug-in running back for the NFL if he gets an opportunity. I mean, he's going to be drafted as a you know backup most likely, but if a starter goes down, I think you could plug in Ray Davis, and he'd be a really nice running back for your team. You know, while your you know maybe starter is. Um, you know, recovering from injury or anything, but he's a downhill runner. And he's, he's got pass catching chops too. And I'm telling you, he ran some routes vertically in Kentucky. So he's just not one of these dump off kind of guys. I think he likes going downfield to catch the ball. And as we want in our leagues, our PPR leagues, we love running backs who can catch the ball, especially if you're a, you know, a route running running back versus just a, you know, a, a dump off pass kind of running back all right so number eight is probably gonna be a surprise to a lot of people i got braylon allen here six foot two 245 pounds not real thrilled he didn't run the 40 at the combine or his pro day that's a little bit of a red flag for me i don't care that he's 20 years old this kid has played three years at wisconsin i get it i know people are so excited about oh he's so young he can grow he can get better but you know kenny he's been playing for three years um you know i mean three years he's been playing right I don't think Braylon Allen plays up to his size. That's my issue with him. And I'm not sure at 6'2", 245, you know, Derrick Henry, I see a lot of comps out there to Derrick Henry, and that's, Derrick Henry's a unicorn. And I don't think Braylon Allen has the footwork and the ability to make guys miss and the elusiveness and the hip, uh, you know, uh, flexibility that King Henry has. And that's my issue with Braylon Allen. I think he, um, you know, he's got decent straight line speed, but I don't think he's going to make guys miss. Um, I don't think he plays behind his pads. I find, you know, one thing I look for in scouting running backs that you should too is at the contact point of getting tackled when he's approaching a linebacker, safety, whatever, does he run square behind his pads and does he want to physically got to have good pad level and you have to want to drive through your defender? And I see him playing small sometimes. I see him, he turns at contact at times and doesn't like the physicality of his game, which is really surprising because he's such a bruising kind of running back. I would think that he would want to just punish people. I don't think he initiates contact. I don't think he loves contact. That's just what I see when I scout film, and that's what I see from him. So my knock on him, and the reason I don't have him higher is because of that, number one, and I don't think he's going to make guys miss. And you didn't run the 40 time, which tells me you're probably pretty freaking slow, um, and you don't want that on your on your scouting grade, and you're just going to go with people watching the film. So couple, you know, he could be a workhorse back given his size, excuse me, but um, the hip stiffness to me um, and the ball security too, he puts the ball on the ground way too often. Um, So that's why I have him here as a tier three guy. I think he, you know, he's probably going to get drafted round, you know, day two. 
Um, so I may be a little lower on him than most, but I'm going to go and trust my eyes. I'm going to trust my own scouting ability. I've been doing this a while. It's a fun hobby for me. I don't consider myself an expert. I just uh, I watch a lot of film, probably more than most people. Um, so anyway, number nine, Bucky Irving. Liked Bucky Irving a lot. Did not test well at the combine. Didn't come in as athletic as I think a lot of people wanted. And if you're this small at 5'10", 195, like I said, I feel like the NFL from the running back position is trying to infuse smaller guys because they're fast, they're speedy. They could be an ultimate weapon. Now, Bucky Irving could be that player. I may be a little too low on Bucky Irving. I had him a lot higher early in my scouting process, but as we're approaching the draft, the draft is in three weeks from now keep kind of dropping him here and there because yes he was a you know very productive back I believe he had two 1,000 yard season but playing in the Pac-12 man Pac-12 running backs scare me Um, go back and look at history the Pac-12 running backs in the NFL aren't great Um, long term you know they might get their their shot at us at a job but going back to Bucky Irving I think he's got the lateral quickness his receiving ability is a plus this guy can catch the ball out of the backfield so if there is an NFL franchise out there that is looking at Bucky Irving as an offensive weapon three third down back I think he could be a spot starter for a little bit if your starter goes down I think he has the physicality and the ability to like carry a team for a, a couple games but his usage in the NFL is going to be limited because he he's never going to be a bell cow back. So he's going to be limited to a third down guy. And there's a there's just a myriad of those guys already in the NFL. And I think he's just going to get lost in the sauce, found finding himself on a team. Um, so um, I don't know. I think he's going to need a lot of space, I think, to really, you know, get those yards that we want but he could be a great PPR asset at the next level so his landing spot is going to be really really important um, to see where Bucky Irving goes all right my last guy I want to talk about in my top 10 is uh, Will Shipley all right now I know I'm probably much lower on Will Shipley than a lot of people there's a lot of people out there liking Will Shipley I'm just not one of those guys I've watched a ton of this kid from Clemson um Yes, he's a nice pass catcher out of the backfield, but man, I saw so many drops on his film as well. But again, he's kind of in the bucket with me with Bucky Irving. Not sure he has the physical play strength to run inside on a regular basis. He's going to be a third down guy because of his size. I don't like his film running inside the tag. I think he's nice. I think he's got some feet to be able to redirect a little bit. But again, at the point of contact, I think he comes up a little soft. I'm not sure. He gives an effort. I just don't think he's got the size to withstand running in between the tackles on a consistent basis. All right, but he's got soft hands. Um, but his yards after contact ability is just average. And I just really question his play strength. And for me, as soon as he declared for the NFL draft, I said, big mistake, Will Shipley. He's a true junior. He should have gone back. And I think it went and for another season to get bigger and stronger. But again, he's just one of the many, many backs with the same archetype of just being a good college running back, but doesn't have any elite traits that is going to make him a, a dynasty you know, s- uh, contributor on a weekly basis, right? So these ranks are really based on you know, not making an NFL roster, but are they going to be a dynasty asset for us to plug in our weekly lineups? And I look at Will Shipley and I don't think in, in 2024, regardless of where he gets, he gets the draft capital or, or the landing spot, he's going to be a guy who's going to get the ball in between the tackles on a regular basis. So he's going to be relegated, I think, to a third down, you know, spot starter um, who might catch a few balls every game, but is he going to be a consistency fantasy starter? I don't think so. So I got him at number 10. All right. So, all right. What you guys are seeing on the screen are my tier four players, right? Tier four are around six and seven, late day three guys who are undrafted free agents. They're going to be late rookie picks, round four, round five in our drafts. And most of these guys are going to be drafted based on landing spot and opportunity. In our rookie drafts, round four and five, is usually where you get away from drafting the talent that you've scouted and players that you believe in, and you're like, okay, I'm in round four, round five. All the premier players are gone. 
I'm left with the scraps. You know, who's going to get an opportunity to get their hands on the ball? And all the players that you're seeing on here, I believe, fit that mold. Yeah, there's a lot of people excited about all these running backs and think, you know, Davis and, you know, Kamani Vidal is getting a lot of buzz right now, is a sleeper and all that. But, you know, he played at Troy and he's five foot seven. I mean, you know, what would, you know, what are the odds that these guys are really going to hit, again, our dynasty rosters? They're going to make rosters. I mean, they're going to get drafted, but are they going to hit our dynasty roster? And am I going to plug them in my lineup on a weekly basis? All the players that you're looking at on the screen, this is part of my dashboard um, that you're looking at. So, all right, there you guys got it. And I'm going to give you one sneak peek to my dashboard product. All right, this is what you're looking at right now is my 2025 running back list. Okay, so this is part of my dashboard subscription. You know, this is, you know, what I already have, you know, pretty much ranked. Um, you click on their names. It's going to give you a scouting report, links to videos, and all sorts of good stuff. So I wanted to give you a sneak peek. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please hit that subscribe button. I'm trying to grow the channel. This channel is dedicated to helping dynasty and fantasy players get really early looks at the future. So um, we're going to be shortly. We're going to be getting away from the 2024 rookie class right after the draft. Man, we are going right into the 2025 class, doing you know sleeper shows and and scouting reports and all that stuff to help you get ready for next year's draft. So hope you enjoyed the show. Hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching and good luck in your rookie drafts.